Christ. All right, let's start with prayer. Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this chance to have a conversation about your will and your scriptures. Through these holy scriptures, we come to know your Son better, understand love for us, and put it into practice in our lives. We can trust this conversation to you with the hands of our Blessed Mother as we say. Hail Mary, Amen. the Lord of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. A couple pieces of housekeeping before we go on to class. And so one is, I'm in an ideal of a break in the summer. Sorry. So, it's <laughs> very great of the last week of June. So, it'll be after um, confirmation year. Last week of June, we'll start again in September. So, it'll be two months. Um, so, take a little break. So, I have to figure out how it works. To continue on with this, I'm happy to do that. You also know there were a few other people in the parish I'm hoping that I would do something um, on the faith, on the dog, or on the decree, things like that. Um, so, so you can talk about that closer to the date, um, see what people are going to do, and um, we'll just keep going and get through as much as we get through. And, you know, um, so June 26th is going to be the June 26th last. June 26th will be the last day of the summer. Okay. Start again, probably September 11th. And that's it? It'll still be Mondays? It'll still be Mondays, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that, so we'll take, we'll take July and August off. <laughs> you. I'm not going away. I'll be here. Um, but just for this class, we'll have a chance to recharge and reorganize. Uh, that's cool. um, secondly, or thirdly, or whatever. Um, so I recognize today we're talking about something you might get lost in. So we'll see if we get to. Um, I'm talking about Joshua, the book of Joshua, the life of Joshua. And so next class, because his life is part of what started controversy, I'm going to Galileo, so I think it's worth talking about. Uh, happened there, what the, the controversy was, what really happened, what didn't happen. Um, so even though it's not directly scriptural, it is based upon an event in Joshua's life, in the story of the description of the book of Joshua. Uh, so it's understanding still. Um, and so we'll get to that next week. The direct and scriptural related, we will spend time covering that, um, depending on. But soon we we cover and finish this class first. Um, just because a couple things in Joshua's life that have been used to try to say the Bible's not valid, not real, and try to say that the church is really relevant. But it's important for us to be aware of that, know about that, and be able to. So, the book of Joshua kind of begins right away. Um, some people, in fact, put the book of Joshua as part of the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, it's all kind of part of the same, same story, the same writing, the same time. It begins kind of right away. It begins, Moses is dead, Joshua's going to be told by God, ready for an invasion. Ready to go and conquer the promised land, you're ready to go and take care of us. So, the very first words of God, at Joshua chapter, chapter 1, verse 2. Uh, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan River, with all his people, the land which I have given to them, all the people of Israel. Every place the soul of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, as I promised and want to Moses. From the wilderness and as Lebanon, as far as the great river, Euphrates, the Euphrates, all along the Hittites, the great sea, or go now the sun, be your territory. The man shall be able to stand before you in all the days of your life, as Moses. I will be with you, I will you over Satan. Then he says this phrase is repeated several times in the scriptures, take courage and be a man. Go and be bold, go and 
They hit the scriptures, they hit upon the law, day and night, speak of them, think about them, don't talk to your enemies. So the very much this tie to the law, righteousness, <coughs> and conquest. And more than just conquest, what's going on is something called the bank. Does anyone know what the bank is? Yes. Yeah. The other word for it is here, right? And what is it? Yeah. And what is that? I don't know. I just so read the, it. <laughs> so the ban basically means you kill everybody, kill the livestock, destroy everything. So you can't. So no one can loot. No one can ever destroy. Get rid of. Everyone gets killed. Man, woman, children. And so the time of these things together, I'm looking really nervous. I think look at this and go, wait a minute. Whoa, hold it. Can this be true? How can God tie these things together? And going far back to the third, fourth centuries was something that was used to um, refute, refute the Bible. Uh, so, how can God, in one place, you know, say, forgive your enemies? And here he's saying, kill your enemies. Does God change his mind? Is this, is this a different God? Is this, is this scripture means this, this made up. <coughs> how can God be tied to? And so this is what, so it's possible we could stop here and do the whole class talking about this. Maybe not, we'll see. Uh, but this is what we're talking about. We're talking about because it's an important idea, we're talking about because it's available something very important for men of us that faith as well. And the first is God Himself, at the very beginning, establishes a war. He establishes a war between good and evil. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. What's the context of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15? Does that remember the context of Genesis 3, 15? Is that when the snake, the serpent, uh, told uh, Eve to go ahead and, you know, and when she did, then he told her, you know, nip at your, you'll nip at her heels and yes. they'll stop on your. So yeah. this is this is a verse that everyone should know, everyone should memorize. Uh, this, this is called the, the first gospel of the church fathers, the proto evangelium. This is the first time in scripture that a savior is mentioned. Uh, Genesis 3 15 is one of the verses you all know. But in the middle of this verse, part of this verse, is God's going to establish a war. He says to the devil, I'm going to put enmity, war, hatred, between you and the woman, the devil and the woman. Between your offspring and her. Your seed and her seed. The very beginning, there are these, this is this division. Between those who follow God and those who follow the devil. Between those who do what's right and those who do what's wrong. Augustine talks about this in the city of God, the city of man. I think that's worth the city of God. But there, there's a bit in there that's divine. And the war ultimately is between good and evil. And we see this going all the way down with Revelation. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17 says this. It talks about the devil being cast out of heaven. The devil tries to attack the woman and the woman is protected by God. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. Then the dragon was angry with the woman, and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, those who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. So you have here again the same division, going back to the very first book of the Bible, the very last book. 
So there is a war. Set by God. There are battles. So one reason why one name of the church on earth is called the church village. We are waging war. We are in the midst of a battle. And the battle line must be wrong. Must not be compromised or um, and it foodling around the other. Foodling is a fun word. Well, <laughs> um, but at the same time, when you look at the New Testament, in the Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, where God, Christ said, He heard said, You'll take your enemies. Down here. But I say to you, remember, then you with his brother. Um, would be glad with judgment. Whoever called another fool, glad with hell. Forgive your enemies. Pray for those who are sick. You have the story in the, in the um, Gospel of Matthew at the, uh, in the garden of Saint where St. Peter uh, sees his Lord grab up the ground and he's so what? He's older, fans. Even though he's a fisherman, he pulls out a sword and he hacks at uh, Malchus's ear and they're trying to, try to kill him. This is shot in the ear. <laughs> Behold, one of those who are with Jesus snapped into his hand and threw out a sword and struck the slave of the high priest off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place. But who take the sword and live by the sword and perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot fill my fall? You're the one who sent me more than the publicans of angels. But how then will the scriptures be fulfilled? But it must be so. When Christ says, You've heard it said, but I say to you, it's not what he's, not what he's saying, You got it wrong before, now you get it wrong. It's not what he's saying, they were idiots in the past, but now they've been through. Sometimes that's how people interpret it. Old Testament, they're stupid, they're fools, we made mistakes, but now we know. What Christ is saying is, I've come to fulfill things. The same person who said the ban in the Old Testament <coughs> says, Forgive the New Testament. What's the difference? Why? Why? The Lord is doing something new. With the incarnation, something new happens. So that these two things aren't contradictory, aren't false, aren't wrong, and actually a whole new child. Let's take a look at some of this. Was it, was it that uh, Yahweh, our first God, I don't want to say first God, but only God, the um, Father, was more into um, scaring the people into. It's the same God. Yeah, but but into scaring people into following the commandments and and leading a life like that. And then when Christ came, it was more of a loving, caring, nurturing type. No, no. Uh, you don't want to say it that way because what that does is that's a division, and there's not a division. You don't want it to be like the Old Testament was about the scary, the Testament's nice. No. Because the problem with that then is you end up thinking that commandments aren't that important. That the God changes his mind. And that Christ protects us from the fall. You end up with a thinking of, I'm not saying you, I mean people. Right, I know. Um, I um, you get this whole idea of, you know, where the wrath of God is out there, and Christ was crucified with the wrath to appease the wrath of God. As the, like it was, um, God was angry to hit somebody, and Jesus said, here, hit me, Dad, if I can take it. Mm -hmm. That's not what's going on. And, and so don't in your mind think, okay, what? Don't think that the difference is not with God. The difference is not, is not that the Old Testament, God's scaring people, or God's being mean. Well, no, it's us, in, in our mentality. He's, doing, he's building a foundation. There's a foundation being which we can't lose. And so it's not that there is a different way of being done simply because um, 
we can handle it now. <clears throat> Honestly, looking at the world around us, we can do this scary. Mm -hmm. Is there's a foundation being built to teach us certain things? But what happens if you, what happens if you build a building and take the foundation out? The fault falls. And the problem is the reason why we've lost some of our morality. So we try to make the New Testament morality and truth stand on our Old Testament foundation. And there's a foundation we cannot lose. Now, again, once one foundation of the foundation is built, it's, it's covered over, it's loose to so it, it. It's not the point of the building. That's the basement. But it still must be there to support the rest of the building. The New Testament does fulfill, complete, show us God's desire. The foundation must remain where everything else collapses. This is why you have, for example, a whole theology which is false. Uh, just be nice, you're a good person. So people can, can in a straight face say, you know, I'm a good person, but I don't go to Mass, don't pray, you know, and, and, don't, and don't live a moral life. I, I sleep around with my girlfriend and I, but I I'm a good person. Well, you're not a good person. <laughs> Living a very bad life. You're in danger of hell. Um, so people can say with a straight face because they think that being good means being kind. They think that as long as I'm kind, okay, to words, <coughs> nothing else matters. Because we've lost this foundation. This foundation is important to live by God. Show us something. Old Testament, so, so, so it's not a contradiction. as a contradiction that you misunderstood something. It's a foundation. We have to keep this foundation in place as the anchor of the roots of our morality. We're not going to understand how to live out the gospel the right way. Now obviously the Lord says this no longer applies. This is the foundation. But this, is still a, this is still, still is not a contradiction. And it must be there to anchor and root our understanding of what the gospel is and how to live it off correctly. It's a huge um, This is why I said he might, might have to work this out. He might take the whole class. Mm -hmm. so, great. so basically, teach them in the way, and, and you know they'll waver off, but at least they have a foundation to come back to. That's what we try to tell the kids anyway. More, more than that. <laughs> a, a, a little more than that. So, what's going on in the Old Testament is God is making very clear evil is death. Sin is death. He's making this clear, first of all, Israel. They could all of us hear. Sin is death. We come, we're at a point that we, again, we, we come to this point in our culture, even among Catholics, where we think the most serious thing in the world is this. No. This sin, or the sin, is the greatest of all evils. Why is one of us the greatest of all evils? Separation from God and evil aware. Hell. Yeah. Rejection of God. And so because God the greatest good, and only the moral sin is ever this from God, the greatest of all evils is moral sin. We don't let that way anymore, do we? <laughs> don't think that way. We think this is a great tragedy. This has been conquered by the resurrection. This is this is a normal life. This is the greatest evil. This is the great tragedy. This is what we're fighting against. Is here. And so what it means is that those who who abide with the moral sin are enemies. How you treat them is different depending on Christ. When Christ comes, we can treat them differently. But the enemy are those who this the moral sin. The world, the flesh, the devil. Um, and so first of all, what's being taught to us, the greatest evil, or sorry, evil is death, sin is death, 
via See, the reason why the people were under the back. Do I have a here? Um, oops, I put it in the wrong place. <laughs> so I put it on the next page. I thought I should look at that. Type up. It should have been up above. <laughs> so Exodus, well, it's, uh, Exodus 15, 16 should have been up. Uh, that, that should have been up. Um, in the Old Testament section. Uh, we have a quote here, Exodus 15, 16. Where God says to Abraham, he's talking about his, his children. He says, your children will go out to Egypt. They'll be there for the fourth generation. But they'll come back at 400 years and the promised land. Because at this point, so the Amorites is yet complete. So when God puts the Amorites on the back, their sin is taking such root in their culture and their land and their people. The only way to limit to, to, to finish the care is it to end it. So it happened in Sodom and it happened in the flood. Uh, this is a limitation of evil. Same thing that happened actually in the Garden of Eden. The reason why there is death in the world. Well, it's a punishment, first of all. But also, second of all, limit you. If there was eternal life without forgiveness, repentance, or healing, then sin is a really miserable existence. Death limits that. Death limits the evil. And so there, there is the saints tell us there are a number of sins Beyond which God won't forgive. What that number is, no one knows. It differs to every person, every culture, every place. But there's a number beyond which there's no more hope. God is not mocked. God is not um, that as long as we're breathing, we have hope. And the Lord's always there. But there is a certain number of sins beyond which we hard our heart so much. You know, not because God's heart is hard, God's not giving it to us, we always love. There's not a certain number of sin, which, which, so, so this, this Exodus 15, 16 is, is an example. For 400 years, there's no man because the Amorites are still hopeful. Their hope is lost, and they're part of the back. So first of all, what's happening is there's a limitation of the, um, Secondly, is men cannot save each other. See, before Christ comes, we cannot do anything. Before the coming of Jesus Christ to save us, to die on the cross for us, to redeem us. Nothing we could do by ourselves could help each other. All we can do is limit evil. We can't redeem evil. By ourselves, we do no good. Um, what is sanctifying Christ? The grace you receive, God. Do you have baptism? What's it do? It makes you God's child. See, God's child is into what? You can go to heaven. Heaven? <laughs> 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 and you can also do what with God? If you with God, it means we can. Work with God in this life. Oh, gotcha. So, our, so without that divine grace, we can't please God, work with God, do anything worth It means our prayers mean nothing, our sacrifices mean nothing, even our death without God's grace means nothing. Only if we were God's child, we do something. 
An analogy I always like to use, we've heard this before, is before, the deep overdrive, I'm saying it again. Darn it. The electricity analogy is that think of your children when they were little. They gave you a little script. Here to do this for you. What did you do with that picture? They gave you was it because of the greatness of the artwork? <laughs> no. <laughs> it wasn't the merits of the art. It wasn't the talents they exhibited. It was the love and the relationship. If I were to draw you a scribble, to hear you go, this is for you, you'd be like, oh, this is really weird. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I have the story put up the fridge, but <laughs> it probably not when you're afraid, you probably you probably would not be very moved by it. different relationship. The relationship makes the work mean something. You know, when someone comes to you have a relationship with, little things they do, either of themselves or small and important, matter a great deal. Without those things, don't mean a lot. Sanctifying grace gives us a relationship with God. But our the things that we do matter a great deal to God. This is what gives our prayers value and meaning. This is what gives our sacrifices value and meaning. This is what lets us work with God in the world, which is part of, of what we are as human beings. Our purpose is to work with God to help create, create the universe. Provide our free will, make ourselves better, drown us go to heaven, make the world be a better place. This is integral to, to our Catholic life. Adam and Eve are created for this. They lost this for themselves and for, for their children. We get it now through baptism. <laughs> we lose this by. We gain it back after, afterwards by confession. Good. Well, what about those that don't know this stuff? Are, are, okay. are, are they still be able to be part of God's children because everybody is God's child? Not that, this way. Not sanctified. Yeah. Uh, because right. without sanctifying grace, there's no different spirits between us and the animals. But the animal is also God's creature, but not God's child in that way. We have a relationship, we're sharing a relationship with who? With who, with who. But if they've never been taught it, how would they know? Well, I think you're, you're called, to, okay. One question at a time. So, sanctifying grace comes from who gives sanctifying grace? Who, who wants all grace? God. Jesus. Jesus on the no, cross. Jesus on the cross. The sanctifying grace, the reason we become God's child, is to share in the sonship of Jesus. We become sons in the Son. So, because of sanctifying grace, because of our union with Christ, we the mystical members of the mystical body, the members of His church, they mean the same thing. Unite the hymns, divide the branches. The what happens to grace, like sanctifying grace. When God looks at us, he sees in us and loves in us, we see and loves the Son Jesus. It's this, this divine affiliation to share in the relationship that the Son of God has with the Father eternal. Those without no fault of their own can receive what's called a baptism of desire. <coughs> And what this is, is those who, through no fault of their own, cannot are baptized and could not be baptized. The Lord looks at their heart and says, Would they have been baptized had they known? They desire to serve me and love me. And if, through no fault of their own, they would have come to him and are trying to serve him, even though they make big mistakes, maybe they're serving the other gods, maybe they're sacrificing the idols, maybe, maybe, who knows? But if they're doing the best they can at what they know, truly, and God will give them the heart. And God will give them sanctifying grace. Still through the Son of Jesus, still through the cross. It's not a different means. But because they're desiring to do what's right, desiring God, looking for God, seeking God, making a mistake, the Lord 
gives them sanctifying grace to the desire they have in the heart to love them and follow them. The analogy I like to use in explaining this concept is I say, look, when I first met you, if I called you Frank, would you be mad at me? Well, yeah, you did call me Frank. Did I? I've got ever since. <laughs> Hey Frank, now are you going to fix that heater? You know, <laughs> I don't know. Right. No, yeah, yeah. You might, you might let it go. You might crack it. You might let it go. If your wife calls you Frank, different story, yeah. right? <laughs> because she knows better. Okay. Wait a minute. Whoa, whoa! Because she knows better. Your best friend calls you Frank. You're, hey, wait a minute, buddy. Whoa, you know. So somebody who knows that you're going to come with a different standard. Someone who you just met you and is making a mistake, you're going to maybe just let it go and not worry about it. Now, if I don't care, you can correct me to the note, my name is, it's not my name, it's I don't care. I want to call you Susan, it makes me feel good, you're Susan now. <laughs> okay. you know, at the very least, we can't be close. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> I refuse to know you. At worst, we become enemies because I'm rejected. When it comes to God, if I say to God, I don't care who you are, if you tell me who you are, I, this makes me feel good, I'm going to treat you this way, I think of you this way. I'm going to call you Zeus, I'm going to do these things, that makes me feel good. I can't know it. Can't have a relationship. Can't have a relationship. Exactly. If make a mistake, go to me and say, well, we tried. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just like if I said, well, we could call you Frank. You say, well, Okay. You were close. <laughs> you were close. <laughs> and so the Lord of the Saints, this is in, in the Gospel of Luke chapter uh, 9, I believe it is, um, where the Lord says that those who uh, know better will be judged more harshly. The servant who knows his master's will to do it will be beaten with many stripes. The servant who does not know his master's will will be beaten less rejected, less harshly. That makes it seem like it's better not to inform yourself. <laughs> <laughs> when, I never, when I got confirmed, I felt that weight on my shoulders, like, oh shit, now I'm like and responsible for more. Except for the fact you must out on this. Mm -hmm. Right? Because the fact is that, yes, it's true, you're going to be less harshly. You also can bomb less deeply. And so, you can't, someone you can't have a relationship with, you can't be friends with. Um, and the love of God is a mystical merit. This, this happens in heaven with God for eternity. In heaven, yes, they're not going to, they're not going to, they're not going to heaven. They're not going to be as close to God even in eternity. Not because, because here on earth they're going to know Him and love Him and follow Him. Those of us who here on earth were given the chance to love God, we have much better opportunity to be with God the closer. Now we still reject that, of course, my personal sins and I make mistakes and obedience. But we have an opportunity to be closer with God even the eternity in heaven. So there's different relationships with God in heaven? Yep. See, I didn't even know that. Well, think, think of Mary and oh, Joseph. Well. <clears throat> they're, they're closer to God even now. And it's, there's different, every saint's a different degree, rank, whatever you want to put it. So there are many rooms that are waiting there, but not all of them are the same? Yes. Not all the same. Yeah. Some are hotel sets. <laughs> no, no. They're all as magnificent as we would let God give us. And they're all the fullness of happiness for us. It's, it's like um, in mathematics, there's different, kind, there's different um, sides of infinity. You know, so, so if you have all the whole numbers, the kind of infinity. If you add different places, between these whole numbers, it's a bigger size of infinity. This is infinity. In having a different length of novels you need to French with God, they're all infinite. Because God's greater than all. But there's different levels. Different relationship. Different relationship is going to be different. Yeah. Um, this, the, there's a story of St. Teresa of the Sow when she was a child and asked her big sister to explain this to her. She put out a thimble, a little milk cup, and a big mug, and filled them full of water, and said to her, Remember, to Therese, he said to me, I can't do So he said to Therese, he added any water to any of these. Those are all perfectly full. 
But which one has more water? Well, the, the giant mom can water. And that's our hearts. In heaven, we're all perfectly full. Perfectly happy, but with jealousy or, or discontent. But those who here on earth love God better will be able to receive more of God. In the same way that, you know, someone who I reject here on earth, or if I am going to call you Susan, yeah, maybe you're not going to be happy because of that. But I can't get to know you, I can't have friendship with you. I can't have union with you at all. I reject it. Or even making a mistake, right? If that mistake's ever corrected, I never get to know you. You might like me, but you might, but it's going to be a very casual acquaintance. And so those who, again, make mistakes, yes, it's true. Um, they can get to heaven. But they have a lot less opportunity to be as close to God. Now that being said, somebody who was an incredibly holy pagan, or Muslim, or, or Buddhist, or whatever, could, could, could maybe come closer than many Catholics. If they did a really good job following God, desiring God, and living a good life, as best as they know. It was a lukewarm Catholic who knew better, just kind of put, 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 put along and barely made it. You know? But, it, but it's isn't... Sorry. Go ahead. To me, what just occurred is that they didn't really know and they were not exposed, then they what they didn't do is they never rejected God. They never chose not to be with God because they didn't even know he was it, it, it would depend. It would depend. Yeah, but I mean um, if they did all the wonderful things and said that the difference is we know right, God. Right. So we, if we deny him or whatever, that is a choice we made. Right. Where if they didn't know of God, right. they never made that choice. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Um, and so somebody who was living the best that can in those in the state, mm -hmm. they end up in a higher place because they struggle with their heart, as opposed to we who knew better only struggle with the tiny pillars of the heart. Um, both would have, um, but we had a very greater chance, a greater opportunity. To be closer to God than me. And so it is worth it to have knowledge because you can be closer to God. So you know, the sacraments to save you, you know, we have a lot of greater help here. But there's no guarantee, it's not quite saying Canada's our problem is all higher than anything else. It's not saying that. But we, we do have a greater opportunity. We do have the fullness of the truth. We do have a, a limitation that's greater than me. Okay. So your question? Yes. What is purgatory for then? Purgatory is a purification. Right. So in this life, he heaven is for the perfect. Hell is for those who reject God. If we are doing, if we end up in God's friendship, it's in divine grace. Mm -hmm. Friendship with God, union with God, friendship with God, same, same, different ways of describing the same thing. Um, if we end up dying, it's in divine grace. But we're not 100% perfect. You need to be purified. So if you die, take a fine grace, but you will over with too much fondness for ice cream. You might not, you might not really have right away. Or if you have a temper you didn't control. Or if there were sins in your past that maybe you confessed, but there are still wounds to yourself and the world around you in repair. I have to make up with that. It's debt. So, so it could be sin we haven't gotten rid of, it could be debt to sin. Because every sin causes two things. It causes guilt and it causes the death. So if I go to your house and I smash your windows up, first of all, you want to apologize. I need to heal that relationship. Then I have to fix your windows. The confessional takes care of the guilt, the relationship. Depending on my heart, it may or may not take care of the debt. Depends. Depends on my heart, my sorrow. Um, it may take care of all of it. It take care of a little bit. One reason why we're given the penance in the confession is to begin to make up for some of the debt. Uh, but certainly that's a token. We should, that's one of the reasons we can be blank. A season of penance, where every Friday is a day of penance, to scrub away some of our debt caused by our, by our sins. Um, and certainly, um, so if, if you die and there is a debt left, you go to purgatory. 
If you die, there's beating of sin, you have, you have, you're not sorry for it, you will purge. But the goal is to die without meaning of sin and without any debt. And you go to heaven right now. Is that possible? Yes. Okay. Yes. But for most of us, <laughs> we're very happy to have My happen, understanding is, doesn't a righteous man sin seven times in a day? Sure. But the righteous man loves God a hundred times a day. Right. And the love for God will overcome those little sins. Um, See, because we have sanctifying grace, my prayers can make up for those things. My charity can go up for those things. This is, this is why you know, John says, love makes up for the sins. Almsgiving makes up for sins. He's not saying the same thing as the professional, but he's saying it's the debt of sin. The attachment to sin, we, we, we can, through Christ, always through Christ, only through Christ, it's not the money, it's sanctifying grace, Union with our actions, we can repay, repair some of these sins, and so our daily sins can be repaired and repaid by daily love, like holy communion, sacrament of the holy one, praying the rosary, doing charity for our neighbor. These are ways we can make up for these things. And so, yes, um, what's supposed to happen is we die, we have right away, purgatory. You need to do your, your job. Purgatory is not where you're supposed to go. You're supposed to go to heaven. Heaven's your goal. Heaven's where you're supposed to be. But the Lord is a very person. You die in this friendship, even if we're total jerks, as long as we stand in the fine grace. We do that for a while forever. Until, until the second coming. Uh, not until the second coming. Um, you're in purgatory, you'll go to heaven eventually. Um, but as long as you die in the sanctifying grace, you'll be in heaven. Because you're still God's friend. Now, once you get out of heaven, your place in heaven might, might be very small, but still be a vision, still you know, with God completely, still a perfect happiness beyond anything we can imagine or hope for, or even see. I'm very confused. Okay. If, if we're the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ yes. is a gift. Yes. And I was told you can't earn or pay your way to heaven. You cannot, absolutely. So then <coughs> say like saying, well, if you say ten prayers or you do this, isn't that kind of like earning? <laughs> it's like that, I mean. So you can't earn. So the book of Revelation, it says that the glory of the saints is the good deeds. It says that God judges the it says that um, love only all the sins. So there is an expectation of us to do something. But there's different ways we earn something. So there's earning by any other black. There's earning by oh, oh, oh. Good job. That was a word at all. <laughs> There's two kinds. Um, they're static titles, but I'm going to give my own names here. I will say merit, strictly speaking. And merit the an asterisk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Merit, strictly speaking, we cannot do. That would mean that, that we could do, give something to God but owed us something. And so it was just, it would be unjust for God to deny us. But we can merit condignly or an asterisk because of the promise of Christ made us. So, if you as a parent tell your son, I will eat the ice cream and eat your vegetables. Now eating vegetables does not make it unjust not to eat ice cream. But eating vegetables is what he needs to be close to that. Yes. Eating vegetables does not merit, strictly speaking, giving him an ice cream. But once you, in your goodness and your heart, say eat your vegetables and your ice cream, 
once he eats that, he has earned it in one sense, mm -hmm. but only because it rules. So we have to do the right thing no matter what. Even if there was no heaven, we have to do the right thing. I'm going to be excused, well, if there's no heaven, fine, I'm going to give you a sin. But that still wouldn't be okay. <laughs> God, as goodness, says to us, I will give you heaven. You do these right things, and therefore, to obey the commandments, all would love him, burns us heaven only because of this. And the asterisk is. So, because of his goodness. Grace is his gift. Because anything we do comes from God, who done it with his help and with his goodness. Grace always comes first. It's first and supports and makes it possible. So before you can even think of a good thought, grace comes first. In <coughs> order to do it to carry it out, you need grace to do it. In order to do it the way that pleases God, you need grace to do it. So would it be our intent that well, even the intent is from grace. The thing about grace, oh. <laughs> this is where the Baptists <laughs> and the Catholics yeah. <laughs> It's like, okay, we got 25 years of both, so. Like, so, yes. I can only influence you if that two guys on the outside. I can come to you, I can force you to do something, I can convince you, I can plead with you, I can beg you. But I can never affect your will. No creature can affect another's good. The, the, the demon and the devil, they can tempt us, they can bribe us, they can promise us, lie to us, only from the outside. God, being the creator, acts in a very different way. He acts on the inside. What the heck does that mean? Well, <laughs> when the sun shines upon a rose bush, the rose plant grows well. The sun is necessary for that rose bush to be with us, to be the rose. Without the sun, there's a rose bush that dies. The sun is not forcing or powering, conquering the rose bush. It's not twisting the rose bush to be something that the sun wants. It's making the rose bush be what the rose bush is supposed to be. It's, it's giving that, that, that rose bush the life that the rose bush is to be. God's grace works like that. It's never from the outside. It's never, it's never a, a, someone coming to us and forcing us or pushing us or bribing us. But it's God giving us life and strength and power to act. So some of these things get very confusing with why it's wrong because of the fact that God's grace is necessary to us. God's grace not only, not only does not overpower all God's grace will let us will in the first place. And so it's one of these things with both hands where it's God's grace works for us completely entirely transforming us. So I can choose to be good. But it does not overpower me and prevent me from freely choosing. It is not God forcing me or tricking me or making me do something. Because then there would be no free will to be God made his pockets. And so God makes us free and allows us to freely choose. It is grace is necessary to do this. And so we, when we have this sanctifying grace, we're able to live in such a way. That's why it's called life. The reason why sanctifying grace is called life, why the sanctifying grace is called death, is because of the fact that the sanctifying grace we can do other things that we can't do. Namely, choose God, please God, work with God, help God. On the surface, that looks at the exact same thing. Without that grace, they're very, very different things entirely. And this is why our Lord even says, "Of some people who die, he's only sleeping." 
right? The, the little girl who dies, uh, sort of last, she's only sleeping. Dead before day, he's sleeping. He's in the fine grace. What the Lord was saying is that their souls are dead. And therefore, they're able to be back on their, their, their Lord. But when your soul is alive, you can choose God, please let work with God, and earn heaven in this sense. But it depends upon God first. So, would it be part of this conversation to remind or touch on how Jesus opened the door to heaven, that you cannot do anything to earn your way into heaven, or climb over the yeah. uh, wall right. versus going yeah. to the gate? So this, that, this never happens. This would be climbing over the wall, forcing a way in, or swimming down and saying, See, Lord, I prayed 12 heaven, I prayed 20 rosaries yesterday, and therefore you better give me heaven, period. <laughs> Without grace, it's nothing. You can't even see this. So Paul says, for example, of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Something we all have heard before, but this is talking about sanctifying grace. First Corinthians what? Thirteen. Wait a minute. Is that first one? Is patient, that one? Yes, first three verses above that. The first verses first Corinthians thirteen, one to three. Oh, okay. Wait some people buy it. This is a wedding reading. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's read at weddings a lot. Yeah. It is. Um, but it really doesn't apply to sanctifying grace. There's two kinds of grace, but. If I speak, oh sorry. <laughs> if I speak in human angelic tongues, do not have love, I am a resounding God of passion and sympathy. Does that say divine grace? It doesn't matter. If I have a prophecy, I comprehend all the mysteries of my knowledge. If I have faith, so I have nothing. I don't have love, I am nothing. We give away everything I own. Hand over my body to death, that I may boast. Do not have love, I can find grace. I gain nothing. But with these things, with sanctifying grace, with love, this is my tiniest prayer, please God. My sacrificing chocolate pleases God. <laughs> you know, in and of itself, what do you do? But as God's child, God's son, as God's daughter, he's an actual way to heaven. This is beautiful thing that the Lord has done for us, is he is, at the same time, he's preserving his place. If God is all from God, it's all a gift from God, it's all a gift from God. We can never. At the same time, to make it real, so that it, what we do and say matters. And truly, for eternity. So that I can, in a real way, earn that. But only okay. through him, with him, and in the deal of the Holy Spirit, the glory of God the Father. That is pretty cool. But a gift is only an offering unless you accept it. Correct. Correct. Um, we still get free will, we still get that, and that's what lets us. Merit, so this is growing in grace, so let's grow in friendship with God, let's just go to heaven. But that's without free will, there's no love. So it's like we need a new word. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 We're trying to describe a human language, a divine reality. No, you're supposed to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, what word is that? Like, what is that? Yeah. 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 Okay. Affiliation <laughs> or. Theosis, okay. <laughs> which actually means divinization.
becoming like God, theosis. The sanctifying grace makes you divine. And so at the times when the church fathers talked about the scripture at times, First, first Peter chapter 1, verse 4, says we share in the divine nature. Um, Psalm 82 says, I said to you, you are gods, all the sons of the most high. But yet you die like an amen. So the osis, this divine, this, this, this divinization, is coming God like, coming like God. Is this word for sanctified grace? And so the Greek fathers, if we're to talk about it in terms of um, the transformation of, of our, our lives, we become like God, a divinization. We share in God's own life. The Western first talk about sanctified grace. But it's all we were going to say. It's, a, it's, all, it's, it's, a, it's all hard to think of. Okay. <coughs> Two words. Um, that's what you're talking about. Can our minds even comprehend? Comprehend? No. no. There's no word. There is no word. For it in, it's in one of those things we're only going to be able to experience now. Right? This is why John says, "I has not seen, ears not heard, God's mm -hmm. prepared." We can get sort of close, but in the end, we're never going really to get it completely. Because God's bigger than we are. Right. Right. You know, the story of Augustine and, and trying to fit the angel, the, 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 the sea in the hole. You know, it's not going to work. <clears throat> you can get something. And so these words are helpful. The, this description is good. But it is not the But it's not the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So we still strive for and try. Mm -hmm. And we strive that most, we're going to really get this most fully, not by reading the book. Of course, that's necessary. Read books. Play it so it is. We get it most fully by living it, by loving, by experience. And so, St. John was the greatest of all theologians, not because he studied other books, and we can do that too, but because he rested on the heart of Christ and experienced that heart. <coughs> He's called John Theologian because at the Last Supper, he rested upon the heart. And so that is, is the important one. Now, if you forget this tomorrow, okay, you know, it's not great. <laughs> but if you live it, that's the more important. And if you know this, then when you repeat the word and teach it, or living it, then you're a fool. It's not going to be good. You can't go can't, can't, can't before God and say, Lord, but I can describe that. Explain that. Okay, great. Then you're more in more trouble because you do live it. <laughs> So it's not what you know, but who you know? <laughs> it's how you live it. Yeah, well, that's how I mean. They get to heaven, they wouldn't get to the pearly gates and St. Peter asked you. It's not what you know, but who you know. Yeah. Oh, I know Christ, you know. Well, and if you, if you aren't living this, the Lord will say, I don't know you. Right. I don't know you. I don't know you. So, yeah, so in that sense, it is you, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Frank. <laughs> Mom, <Susan. laughs> um, okay. Yeah, that's true. And, and this is why I would like to kind of cover creeds on the other stuff, but it's, it's all of it. All of it. Ready to say it again? You should just say it again. And I always go that instead. Yeah, erase it anyway. <laughs> yeah, but I think I'm going to miss the first page, darn it. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so going back to this, right, the greatest evil, so sin is death. The greatest evil in this life is sin. Because we lose the sight of God. Sanctifying grace, rest of God, and God. The reason why hell is eternal is because of the wrong repentance. We, we, through our own fault, um, stay attached to our sins, rejecting God. So without Christ, the Christ comes, no man can stay. 
The analogy I like to use is, oh, I'm going to get Beverly, sorry. Yeah. I think I'll be sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, if I borrow $20 from you, can I borrow 20 more and pay you back? We said it's you, I probably did. I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> Um, would that, would that work for you? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you say. No, I don't want to say that. I mean, is that in the business transaction? Like, I borrow money, you can pay it back by our income. No. No. Because you may not pay me back. <laughs> <laughs> well, but have I paid you back, I borrowed you to pay back. So, if it's like borrowing it all this from I borrow 20 more and then take it. That. Isn't that how the treasury is? No. Is The thing about the life here on earth is we all got it. God is the creator, God is with everything. And so when we can't Take from our creation, he made, give us to us, pay him back. No man can say to each other, say to ourselves, pay God, because we keep borrowing from God's creation to pay God back. Among other reasons, but that reason alone, there's other reasons too. But for that reason alone, you know, we can't say to God, Lord, but, but I died for you, but I own that. But Lord, I built you a church, but I own that. But Lord, like everything we do, is taking this from his, but sorry, his. Mm -hmm. he, he'll, he'll, he'll never. So we want. And so no man can save it. Christ is different because Christ is truly God. And so when Christ comes, he is able to, as a man, add new things to the world. He's able to add, new, add something new, something great, something tremendous. And the love he had, the weakness he had, the goodness he had to the universe is a million times and infinitely more times greater than the evil you've all done, any human being has done, all human beings have done, added together. And so we're saved through the sanctifying grace we get the cross. Now, before I ever need, after you've got this to creation, after you've had sinned, we would get sanctifying grace of being their children. Simply, by being conceived, as the son of that name. Now we get to baptism of the cross. But before a graph had come, God said, I'll leave it with me. We can't say to each other, we can't forgive sin. Is sorry, the third thing happening is that so limiting evil as limiting evil, first of all, the people who are being under that because that's, that's they can't do anymore. It's limiting evil, um, it, it, it's a mercy because it's giving them the last chance to repent and come back to God. It is saving the children that were killed because it's keeping them from committing this mortal sin, the intractable culture. The other thing it's doing is it's preserving Israel. So what's trying to get Israel to understand is that they have to be different than the rest of the world. And throughout history, unfortunately, Israel, just like all too many of us, when they get trapped in the world, the world will follow them, they follow the world. They don't go in the world, all of a sudden change the world, they begin imitating the pagans. The pagans are imitating them and worshiping God. They begin sacrificing the children of demons. And so when the Lord places these nations under the ban because of their sin, of <coughs> He's limiting sin and evil and preserving Israel. He is teaching Israel very clearly these things are worse than death. These things deserve death. These things we stay away from, these things fly, fly, flee from the river. Because if not that, 
would happen is we would lose this. If this weren't the case, and more of a protecting user observing Israel belonged to that, we would lose the share of the ownership and would help. Yes, sir. Okay. We don't remember that. Yeah, yeah. Just making sure I got it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's also why this is a foundation, not a contradiction of the testament. And it's become the foundation. Because now in Jesus Christ, when Jesus comes, Jesus said, okay, now, now it's not okay, and we're bad. It's only this thing. Sorry, I erased it. Back like this thing. <laughs> there is still New Testament. There is still a war against evil. But it's against sin. First of all, ourselves. So the battle through Christ, because now Christ has come, there is not able to be forgiven. Now it is able to be healing. There is able to be salvation. It's a different kind of battle. But it's preserving and limiting. Now it's saving and healing. So here it's limiting and preserving. Here it's healing and saving. Why is it different? Because God became man. He just came to us dying on the cross. He just comes to us as giving us his very life. And his life is divine. So again, it's not a contradiction. This is a foundation. We can't lose this. You can't forget these lessons. You can't, you can't ignore those things. You can't say, oh, well, we're, as long as we're nice, evil will bring us to hell. Sin is the worst thing in the world. We must stay away from these things, fly from them, because they will make us leave God of God. They harm the one we love most dearly, God Himself. But now, because Christ has come, the war we truly fought, not against each other, but against sin. Now we can make war, especially by prayer, fasting, by carrying our crosses. And by seeking conversion of heart. And we seek this not just for ourselves, but for our enemies. And because now Christ has come, there can be conversion. Now Christ is not conversion. Now Christ is also like the pentacle healing. Now that Christ has come, there is conversion and healing and salvation and redemption. As the greatest way to defeat your enemy. God tells us to make them friend. Help them get rid of those things that make it in their hand. Which is sin. Sin makes people run up, it makes everyone run up. Get rid of sin, and everything is healed. So our struggle is not of flesh and blood, but of the principalities. Right. But without Christ, this is the best we can do. This is the foundation. And now there can be forgiveness and healing. Salvation. Especially because of baptism, confession, of the sacraments. And so again, these things are not contradictory. Does that make sense? These things are, are not put to their place. These things are not simply, well, that was the old way, that was the new way, almost was better now. This is building off of that. So the fulfillment of that. That foundation necessary and needed, we can't forget it. Because if we forget it, what happens? We think, well, we're not really waging war against anything. We forget the enemies. We forget what the mistakes are. We forget why we are war. We forget who we are. So we need this. Say Joshua 
wage war against parents. <laughs> so it's a simple concept, but it's so important. And you will see people going back and they'll look at this and they'll reject Bible. Or they'll say, God, Old Testament is the big piece of me. Yeah. No. Is it? So he's both just and merciful, yeah. not one and the other, or vice versa. And the Lord is very clear in the New, in the New Testament. You know, he will tell those who reject him, depart from me. People only pick one. They either think he's just or he's merciful. And in fact, more than that, in God, they're the same thing. In God, his justice is mercy, and his mercy is justice. And Teresa of the So says that she expects as much from God's justice as from his mercy. Going back to the barrack, yeah. the aspects. That because of God's promises, we can go to God and say, Lord, see, I didn't control you. And you promised me these things, you were good to you, were good, and I believe your promises. And therefore, in your justice, not my justice, but in your justice, I can expect the reward. Now, is it also God's mercy? Absolutely. Of course. But I can expect as much of his justice from his mercy. It's not justice is bad, mercy is good, and they're together. Well, that helps to explain it to other people about why we read the old and the new. Yeah. Because so many people have told me that they've never even looked really at the Old Testament. Right. And uh, I've read more of the Old Testament than I have the New Year, truthfully. But um, it's just, you know, I could never explain how it comes together. I know it was a foundation, but I, now it helps me to, to be able to, when somebody asks me, you know, I say, well, why, why do you care so much about the Old Testament? Because that's the foundation of it. And Christ says so. Because you go to the Gospel of Luke, and the Gospel of Luke, when Christ rose rise from the dead, he begins by explaining Moses the prophets. Yeah. When, when the apostles priests of the Acts, they don't, don't say, well, forget the Old Testament. Here's some new stuff for you. They begin by saying, God said these things to our fathers. It's good enough for our Lord and the apostles. It's good enough for me. Yeah. But so many people say, well, Jesus came to... You know, and he fulfilled all that stuff, so all we really need to know is about him. But, you know, that's what I've heard. You yeah, know, no, people it, saying it, that. Absolutely. People will say, that. yeah. Yeah. And, and you end up that not knowing him because you got rid of half of his relationship. Right. Yes, he was a rabbi and taught and went over all of that. Yeah, those are people just trying to skip the wedding. <laughs> 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 well, I, I, <laughs> Yeah, well, actually, you know, my sister's a Baptist, and my sister is Baptist, and these are the kind of conversations that I have with her about, you know, about the stuff and, and, and her thing. It's, you know, when Jesus came, we're done with it. You know, I mean, that's we're we're saved by by Christ it Himself. It depends on what church they went to. Sure. Yeah. The Baptist church I went to, the way they explained Revelations to me was through the Old Testament. Okay. Because I was so confused by Revelations, and I'm like, wow. <laughs> yeah. and, and how many Catholics? So we that? had a whole class on how Revelation was like the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Yeah, right. And so, but it's like everything, every church is different even within a church. Mm -hmm. And um, so I've always stood up for it when people, people say, things about the Catholic Church, because I have lots of Baptist friends still. <laughs> and, um, but they have misconceptions, severe misconceptions. So every Catholic knows this stuff. Every Catholic but, hates stuff, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. There are a few Catholics that have misconceptions about like, the Baptist Church and the preaches. And, but that doesn't mean every Baptist Church teaches that. And the thing I find the most just Setting are these little books that are supposed to be like the verse of the day, and they go through and they, they pick out one little tiny verse, 
God's going to do this for you, and God's going to do that for you, and God's going to do this for you. But they leave out the but. This is what you need to do for God. So, Have you seen that there's, there's this picture that's apparently it's in the book, but some place will quote the Gospel of Luke. Mm-hmm. All these things shall be yours if you die out of worship. But they don't say who said that. Who said that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously? It's in the it's Bible. Bible. It's in the Bible. There's no way in context. context. Oh. Yes. But that happens in lots of churches. In, the yes. in all churches in different areas. But well, and unfortunately, again, how many Catholics do the same thing? Right. You know, pick and choose, or read the Bible at all, or, um, you know, there's so many Catholics who, who you know, you know, this the title. <laughs> we're 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 Most yeah, Baptists that. just think Catholics don't read the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> <That's a great laughs> well, except for every Sunday. Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> if they listen. <laughs> but, but I can say that there's these misconceptions sure. because people don't know. Well, just like they, you know, they, they worship Mary. And yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, just yeah. that. And certainly. Sometimes the worst fights can be from these misconceptions. You know, yeah. So we all the same, we the same thing, we're in the same thing, this is each other on time. Um, C.S. Lewis talks about having this argument over an hour because of this same this, a problem language where they were arguing about that was personal. And when C.S. Lewis meant personal about him at having a free will, being loving and knowing. The other person meant being a human being. <laughs> You yeah. got a physical body. Mm-hmm. And so there's our own argument that God can be personal, he has to be personal, simply because they didn't define their terms that were meant the same thing, <laughs> real the same thing, and this long argument, they couldn't understand what that person was, what person was, who believed this stuff, you know, because they were the same thing with different words. So the great thing, Michelle, what's Michelle that does the teenagers at our church? Cultural. What is it? Michelle Cultural. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. Would she? We were in another Bible study last year, and so we were going along, and what she, what we kind of came to know was that purgatory, they talk about purgatory, the Baptists do, but they just call it purification. And Michelle Michelle said the the wisest thing, she said, purgatory is just the name of where you get purified. But they say the same things. They say, like, when I was a little kid, I was so afraid because it seemed like every time I went to church, we were in Corinthians, and I'm like, oh, man, we're going to go through the fires of hell again. <laughs> but they talk about when you die, you have to go through the fires of hell to get to heaven, but they just don't call it purgatory. So it's not exactly the same, but, but there are still things that are similar that they just call it different stuff. Well, they said it, it, it's going to depend on the, on the church. It does depend on the church. church. Yeah. It, and our Bible, does it say purgatory? No. no. It doesn't. It just says the cleansing fire, the right. purification of gold, uh, it, it, silver, and all that. How it purifies so the, brings out the impurities. And that's where everybody gets that. The book from. of Maccabees yeah. talks about but it. But I was yeah. confused because right. I, I was trying to grasp purgatory. Even though we're in Trinity, it's not the Bible. Yeah. I doubt very many Baptists would deny it. I doubt very many Baptists would deny the Trinity. <laughs> yes. um, yeah. but, but it's not in the scriptures. Right. It's a word that, that was developed later. The meaning's there, the purpose is there, but the word is something that was, was added later. Just to clarify, not everything's in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> At least not explicitly. It just the There's other resources we have. <laughs> Yeah, because I went to you know, my sister about purgatory, and I told her there's seven times in the Bible that it talks about purification, what we call purgatory, uh, you know. Yeah, that's and, what we came to that, that it was the same right, thing. And, yeah. uh, she didn't talk to me for like two weeks, and then she calls me back and says, okay. Well, it just depends on if you're a free will Baptist or so. <laughs> no. Yeah. So, 
It's seven twenty. <laughs> <laughs> we can end it here. We need the um, if we end it here, we probably will not cover Galileo next time. And I suspect we'll be like this class, <laughs> we'll end up in a lot of rapid trails. Again, yeah, some of the things that's necessary, talking about what is going on when the sun stands still, what's not going on, what is it to say, what turns out to say. Um, well, as a professional astronomer, I was very intrigued by that. <laughs> 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 and, and so, so we'll get we'll to it. We'll get to it. It's a matter of what. Uh, so, for today, do you want to wait? Or do you want to try going on, pushing forward? It is good. It's 7 point. Uh, um, I would say wait myself. Mm -hmm. yeah. How much more is that as far as you look, you look at this and say, wow. 30 minutes. Yeah. I, I think yeah. we spent an hour exactly. on the yeah. line. <laughs> 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 it depends on what the question is. <laughs> 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 so these are, you got tape? You got some tape? I can give you the 30, 30 second version. <laughs> <laughs> I can give you the three hour version. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this it sounds like maybe waiting next week. Good night. 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 So then we'll start on point two. <laughs> 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 At least we got to do the first thing. Uh, well, uh, yeah. um, oh, I, 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 I didn't have a verse, but I didn't move the verse off my head. Yeah. Just I, just think, said, uh, yeah. I was sitting and I couldn't find it. And maybe maybe it's people left. friend saying, you know, I'm so worried about you that yeah, I'm praying for your soul. That's my sister to me. Yeah, I want you to yeah. go to heaven. I want you to go to heaven and you shouldn't be a Catholic. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's my sister to me, yeah. Well, at least it's from a good place. <clears throat> yeah, true. I thought it was an atheist somewhere. I forget. You probably know exactly what we're talking about. I can never quote them right. But the atheist said that you must hate me so much to not care. About sharing your faith with me, if you really believe in it. It's a, his name is Pendulette. See, it's a, 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 it
So it's the, it's the same, the same team. Oh, um, so the look up online, a pen is given a Bible. And there's a quote there where he, where he says, I've never understood why people don't go like proselytizing. Because if you believe that I can go to hell without all of this stuff, how much do you have to hate let me go there and not say anything? Yeah. Yeah. Atheist. I don't remember what I said. <laughs> so, 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 I said that in the next chat. When I told Jamie we were taking this <laughs> summer, he's going to be because he goes, the school's going to be out on the 25th and I can go back to class. <laughs> 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 it's the 28th. It's the 26th. Yeah. He's going to be out. Oh, really? It's the 25th is when that's? The school's out on the 25th. Of June? Oh, no, May. Oh, yeah, so you can go to four of them. You can go for a month. Come for a month. Yeah. And yeah. you told me you was looking forward to it. <laughs> well, maybe yesterday, I'll, I'll, I'll work for you. <laughs> All right, let's close the prayer. Though. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Mm-hmm. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your goodness to us. We thank you for sending us your Son, healing us, forgiving us, bringing us back. Help us to understand more clearly who you are what you've done for us. And that's more important to live it out in our lives. We all that we say and do be for your glory. Glory be to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your Spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much.